the History Channel original podcast. Hello, my Texas friends. In moments of great decision, the Bible advises, come now and let us reason together. This is a time for us to reason together. We must put aside our little quarrels and our petty arguments, and we must reach the decisions that will preserve America for ourselves and for our children. It's 12.29 p.m. on November 22nd, 1963, and Vice President Lyndon Johnson hates his job. From the back of a light blue 1961 Lincoln convertible, he waves to the crowds gathered along the roadside in Dealey Plaza. He's smiling, but inside, he's seething. Sidelined within the administration, drained of political influence, relegated to pulling up the rear of Jack Kennedy's motorcade. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the street park. But in one minute, his boss will be shot. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. In one minute, he'll be called upon to guide the free world through one of its most dangerous moments, the commander-in-chief shot, possibly by communist enemies, and with the United States nuclear codes lost in the chaos. The United States and the Soviet Union stand on the verge of direct military confrontation. In one minute, he'll be faced with the most difficult task of his career, to stabilize the U.S. government and project unity with a grieving Kennedy family, a family that despises him. Bobby Kennedy was mercurial, angry, and he saw Johnson as like a creature from another planet. In one minute, Lyndon Johnson will go from a political afterthought to the most powerful man in the world, and everything will depend on the actions he takes in the 24 hours to follow. On Johnson's left, the clock tower on top of the old red courthouse reached 12.30. Then, a shot rings out. I'm historian Steve Gillen, and this is 24 Hours After, The JFK Assassination, Episode 2, The Vice President. In our first episode, we described the assassination from the perspective of one of the people who loved Jack Kennedy most, his wife. While the attack would shatter Jackie's life forever, in some ways it would be even more consequential for someone he wasn't very close to at all, his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson. This time, we reveal the urgent decisions Johnson will have to make in the minutes following the shooting. Decisions he'll have to make without critical information. Is the president wounded or dead? Who conducted the attack and why? Was it an act of war? And perhaps most ominously, would the killer or killers target him next? To understand his decisions, we'll first need to understand LBJ himself and how someone once known as the most powerful person in Washington ended up in a dead-end job on the verge of irrelevance. To do that, let's start with a simple question. What exactly were Johnson and Kennedy doing in Texas in the first place? Beneath the glitter and the glamour, people still wonder about the substance of the Kennedy presidency. JFK hopes to still all doubts in a second term. Texas, with its 24 electoral votes, is considered critical to re-election in 1964. The two men went together to Dallas in November 1963 to try to resolve some problems in the Democratic Party in the state. Here's Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. It was surely going to remain very important to the Democratic Party's prospects for the presidency in 1964 as well. Texas was changing in this period in a more conservative direction. For a Democrat to win the White House in the 50s and 60s, 
they needed to also win the state of Texas. It had been a Democratic state for decades, but the issue of civil rights was driving conservatives away from the party. To win re-election, JFK needed Texas Democrats unified, and Lyndon Johnson was the man who could help him do that. Texans have always played an important part in the Democratic administrations of recent years. Well, what everyone says is that he was big, and he was literally big. He was a bit over 6'3". He had enormous hands and ears. But I think he was also figuratively big. He was the biggest personality in any room that he walked into. Johnson was an old-school politician with a reputation for arm-twisting, a dealmaker so skilled that in 1958, Time magazine called him the most powerful man in Washington. But despite his humble beginnings, he had always dreamed big. He was an extraordinarily ambitious person, and this is one character trait that runs through his entire career. There are stories of Lyndon Johnson as a boy talking about wanting to be president of the United States. This quest for approval and power drove him constantly to be looking for the next highest office. Johnson was elected to the House in 1937, then to the Senate in 1948. He devoted himself to the study of government, mastering the legislative process. By 1954, he had risen all the way to Senate Majority Leader. And today, Lyndon Johnson is proud to be standing behind and beside the next Democratic president of this country. I present to you proudly Jack Kennedy, the next president of the United States. Johnson was a New Dealer, a believer in the power of government to help people, and he'd come to be sympathetic to the cause of civil rights. But his ambition also forced him to be pragmatic. To win office in Texas, he couldn't be seen as too liberal on racial issues. On the other hand, to be a national figure, he couldn't be perceived as too close to the segregationist. And so he had carefully positioned himself between the wings of his party, trying not to alienate either. It's important to remember that from the Civil War through the 1960s, the former Confederate slave states leaned heavily Democratic. It was Southern Democrats who had implemented Jim Crow, racist laws that restricted the lives of black Americans. And it was Southern Democrats who supported segregation. Fred Harris was a senator from Oklahoma in 1964. He was a supporter of President Johnson. At that point, uh, 1964, when I went to the Senate, there was not a uh, single Republican senator from any of the 11 Confederate states. They were all Democrats, but they were highly conservative and largely racist uh, Democrats. But they also, those Democrats, were uh, really uh, the most powerful senators uh, by seniority and headed uh, most of the major committees. For a time, the northern and southern wings of the party could overlook the issue of race, focusing instead on areas of agreement, like Social Security and public works, and foreign policy issues like the fight against fascism and then communism. But by 1963, 100 years after the Civil War, this uneasy truce was falling apart. The Civil Rights Movement had brought national attention to Jim Crow in the South, and JFK had proposed civil rights legislation that was working its way through Congress. This had the effect of creating some lines of fracture within the Texas Democratic Party. One faction was becoming increasingly hostile to the Kennedy administration because of the perception that Kennedy was too liberal, whereas others in Texas were still willing to stick with the administration, not least because the native son, Lyndon Johnson, was part of the ticket. Johnson was a son of the South, widely respected after decades of public service. He was also a national figure, a canny politician who had managed to avoid being tainted by the segregationist policies of his home state. Most of all, he was a dealmaker. All to say, if there was anyone who could bring together the warring factions of the Texas Democratic Party, it was LBJ. Kennedy called him to Texas. He met with uh, Johnson and then Governor John Conley and told him, you get this party unified and you get in a position to support me financially and at the polls in 1964. And we're gonna have a campaign tour and they set the date for late November. 
Which brings us back to Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. When the shots ring out, Johnson hardly registers them. His wife, Lady Bird, who is riding next to him, hears two loud cracks and assumes that someone in the crowd has set off fireworks. Johnson will only know something is wrong when he's tackled by a Secret Service agent. Here's Randall Woods, author of LBJ, Architect of American Ambition. Rufus Youngblood was head of the team that was assigned to him in the Secret Service, uh, threw him on the, on the floor and jumped on top of him. Johnson remembered with both his knees and his elbows in his back. What raced through my mind was that if they had shot our president driving down there, who would they shoot next? And what would they, what was going on in Washington? And when would the missiles be coming? And I thought that uh, it was a conspiracy, and I raised that question. And nearly everybody that was with me raised it. This KLIF bulletin from Dallas, three shots were reported and they were fired at the motorcade of President Kennedy today near the downtown section. KLIF News is checking out the report. We will have further reports. Stay tuned. p.m. Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson are pinned to the floor of the vice presidential limousine. Special Agent Rufus Youngblood lies on top of them. His body is a shield. Here's Randall Woods again. They couldn't see anything. But Johnson remembered hearing the crackling of the two-way radio. The Secret Service people were talking to each other. And he knew that there had been an assassination attempt. And so they're not allowed to raise their heads until they get to Parkland Hospital. The moment the Secret Service realized that JFK had been hit, they rerouted his car to Parkland Hospital. Despite the security risk, Johnson follows, hoping to learn more about the president's condition and plan next steps. From their position on the floor, the Johnsons can feel the car careening through Dallas, up Elm Street and onto North Stemmons Freeway. The car's radio still plays at full volume. Everyone in the car is silent. They don't dare ask the question aloud. Are the Johnsons being hunted too? 12.35 p.m., about five minutes after the shooting, the car screeches to a halt. The car stops. They're allowed to look up, and they see this neon sign, Parkland Hospital. As soon as they arrive, Johnson is mobbed by Secret Service agents. They rush him into the hospital through the emergency entrance. He's no more than a few feet away from the limousine where Jack Kennedy lays lifeless in his wife's arms. But Johnson's view is obscured. He can't see the blood-stained limo. He doesn't know the condition the president is in. Lady Bird follows the crowd of men. I cast one last look back over my shoulder and saw a bundle of pink. It's like a, a drift blossoms lying in the back seat. I I think it was Mrs. Kennedy lying over the president's body. Youngblood, the Secret Service agent, leads the Johnsons through the maze of brightly lit hallways. Not even he knows where they're headed. He's looking for a secure room somewhere out of the way. Where will Johnson be safest from the threat of another attack? They don't know whether this is a general assault on the entire administration. They don't know what's going on, but they want to protect the Johnsons. Finally, Youngblood finds an examining room deep in the bowels of the hospital. He positions the Johnsons in a cubicle furthest from the door, a small, quiet room with blue tile. Isolated from the drama unfolding a few yards away, all Johnson can do is wait. And while he waits, he worries for the president, for himself, for the country. Who could have done this? His mind races. His first thought is that Kennedy has been the victim of a communist conspiracy, the result of escalating Cold War tensions. American citizens have become adjusted to living daily on the bullseye of Soviet missiles located inside the USSR or in submarines. Here's Mark Lawrence again. 
In the period that we're talking about, in the early 1960s, the Cold War was absolutely front and center for Americans in a day-by-day, hour-by-hour way. The ebb and flow of U.S.-Soviet relations was headline news virtually every day. And lots of Americans lived in fear of the possibility of war and, of course, most alarming of all, the danger of nuclear war that could transform, if not destroy, human life on the planet. There was good reason to be afraid. A year earlier, the U.S. had discovered Soviet-built missile sites in Cuba, just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. The U.S. responded by forming a naval blockade around the island to prevent the Soviets from delivering even more weapons. A series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The incident became known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. In this moment of national crisis, JFK had not turned to his vice president for support. Johnson had been kept in the dark about details. And like the rest of the world, he waited and held his breath for nearly a week before the Soviets agreed to remove their missiles. So it didn't take a lot of imagination for Americans to suspect that maybe the Cubans were behind this. The Cubans were understood to be the proxies of the Soviet Union, such that you know anything that was carried out by Cuban agents would have been approved in Moscow and therefore been a provocation of the absolute highest order. And in those early moments at Parkland, it dawns on Johnson that the U.S. is even more vulnerable than he imagined. Because in all the chaos, the briefcase containing America's nuclear launch codes has gone missing. Here's Randall Woods again. Well, it was in Kennedy's car. The president always has those codes at hand. And a Secret Service person or an aide always has those codes at hand, wherever the president is. So Johnson's asking his detail, do you know where that black box is? And is it secure? Fortunately, the codes are quickly recovered. But Johnson moves on to another danger in his mind, that the attack may have been planned by domestic enemies. Kennedy's advisors were very apprehensive about doing a motorcade in Dallas because Dallas had a reputation of being an ultra right wing city. When Lyndon and Lady Bird had been campaigning there in 1960, they'd been surrounded by a hostile crowd that spit on them or yelled at them in October. There had been placards on the street showing a silhouette of Jack Kennedy being hung in effigy. So there were some of his advisors who warned him not to go to Dallas. What if the shooter is a far-right Texas radical? What might that mean for the climate in the country? A war with a foreign enemy is certainly a terrifying prospect, but it could be even more destabilizing if the assassination turns America against itself. At 12.38 p.m., eight minutes after the shooting, a Secret Service agent named Emery Roberts enters the room. He confirms what Johnson has already deduced. The president has been seriously wounded, and he gives Johnson his first report on Kennedy's prospects. He would later recall in a formal statement, I did not think the president could make it and suggested that we get out of Dallas as soon as possible. The Secret Service wants to get Johnson to Washington where they can better protect him. And it's at this moment that Johnson will need to make his first difficult decision of the day. Does he follow the direction of the Secret Service and flee Dallas to protect his own safety? Or does he remain at Parkland to see to the needs of Jackie Kennedy, to confirm the condition of the president, and to help coordinate the national response? Johnson plays for time. He wants more information. And he doesn't want to leave the hospital until he hears directly from the president's closest aides, specifically Kennedy's special assistant, Kenneth O'Donnell. O'Donnell served as Johnson's point person in the Kennedy administration. Johnson hated the way he was handled as vice president, and O'Donnell was the one doing the handling. He had felt disrespected by O'Donnell almost from the moment of the inauguration. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. 
The job of the vice president has long been regarded as virtually powerless. It was a poor fit for a man like Lyndon Johnson, someone incapable of sitting on the sidelines. So when he took office in 1961, he resolved to transform it. Johnson wanted to show Kennedy that he was ready for more than just ceremonial duties. He was trustworthy and ready to work hard. He presented the president with a memo outlining ways to expand the powers of the vice president, making it meatier by giving him general supervision of several agencies. Kennedy politely passed, but Johnson was mortified to find out that a group of Kennedy's advisors leaked his memo to the press. That group included Kenny O'Donnell. During the next few years, Kennedy's inner circle handed down more embarrassments to Johnson. He was excluded from policy meetings. His access to the president was limited. Johnson was sure the Kennedy administration looked down on him, regarding him as a country rube, unworthy of inclusion in their Harvard-educated clique. All of Lyndon Johnson's greatest fears about what the vice presidency would mean came to pass. <laughs> it was a terribly frustrating experience for him. He was given very little responsibility. He was mostly ignored. Johnson was miserable as vice president. The, the Kennedy sent him off on sort of pointless foreign tours in which he would drink too much and offend the locals. And uh, you could tell by his appearance, he became slovenly and drank too much, smoked too much, he was depressed. He was miserable. Johnson was so miserable that by November 21st, 1963, on the eve of his trip to Dallas with Jack Kennedy, he had made a secret decision. He was going to quit. On the night of the 21st, in the hotel room at Fort Worth, he and Kennedy had gotten into an argument. Kennedy chastised him for not getting Texas lined up, and Johnson had responded very defensively. And he'd actually decided that after the visit to Texas, he was going to tell the Kennedys he wasn't going to be on the ticket. But now, standing in the safe room at Parkland Hospital, the world has changed. Minutes earlier, Johnson was a has-been, stripped of political power, so unhappy that he was planning to quit altogether, likely ending his career. But now, if Jack Kennedy is dead, Johnson is the President of the United States. It's an achievement he has dreamed of and fought for since childhood. And now it has been thrust upon him under the most horrific circumstances possible. But only if, God forbid, Jack Kennedy is dead. And so he wants to hear it from O'Donnell, one of the people who would be most reluctant to pass the torch. Johnson knows that he needs to tread carefully. He can't look like he's stepping over the president's body to grab power. And on a personal level, if he were to leave while Kennedy still had a chance of surviving, while he fought for his life, Johnson would never forgive himself. Johnson also worried about Jackie. What would she think if he left? Would she feel abandoned? At 1240, Johnson sends Emory Roberts out to find O'Donnell. In this moment, Jack Kennedy is already dead, and the United States is leaderless. And yet the man who will replace him Lyndon Johnson has no idea. It'll be half an hour before O'Donnell comes to Johnson's safe room to deliver the official word. Kenny O'Donnell comes in and tells the Johnson that the president's dead, 120. So it's an hour, about an hour. John F. Kennedy has died, and Lyndon Johnson is once again the most powerful man in Washington. It's 1.20 p.m., on November 22nd, 1963, Lyndon Johnson has just learned that President Kennedy is dead. What he doesn't know is why. Was it a plot by right-wing extremists? Communists? Was it one lone actor? Or many? His mind reels. Mr. Kildoff entered and said to Lyndon, Mr. President. Johnson looks up, startled. The expression on his face is one that Assistant Press Secretary Mac Kildoff will always remember, later recalling, he turned and looked at me like I was Donald Duck. This, in the small tiled room in the back of Parkland Hospital, marks Johnson's first time being addressed as Mr. President. 
Killoff poses a question to the new president. Can he announce Kennedy's death? Would that be all right? Johnson tells him to wait until after he has left the hospital, just in case Kennedy's shooters are on his trail. At 1.26 p.m., Secret Service agents surround the Johnsons and rush them from the small room, back through the winding corridors and into a pair of unmarked police vehicles. To confuse a potential assassin, Lady Bird and Lyndon take separate cars. Johnson takes one last look at Parkland Hospital, where Kennedy's body remains. He hunches down into the back seat so that no one can see his face. At 1.30, an hour after the assassination, Matt Kildoff makes his announcement to the press. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. But by then, the word has already spread, and America is already in mourning. Lady Bird would always remember that drive to Love Field, the airport where Air Force One is waiting. We drove along as fast as we could. I looked up at a building, and there already, there was a flag at half-mast. I think that was when the enormity of what had happened first struck me. As Lyndon's car speeds toward the airport, one of the motorcycle policemen begins to sound his siren. The new president tells him to cut the noise. They can't afford to draw attention to themselves. At times, Johnson remembered they'd cross the median and drive against the traffic. They're at Love Field in 10 minutes. Still concerned about a sniper, Youngblood leaps from the car and uses his body to shield Johnson. They practically sprint up the ramp to Air Force One. The decision was made that they'd fly back on Air Force One, the president's plane, not Air Force Two, because it had more sophisticated uh, communications equipment. Johnson's security team opts to put the new president on Kennedy's Air Force One, a custom Boeing 707. They close all the shades and sit in the darkness. Johnson insists that they wait on the tarmac for Kennedy's body. He won't take off without him. He notices a small television set playing the news. Having been in hiding for the last hour, he has no idea how the nation is handling its grief. Lyndon Johnson, I think, understandably, probably believed that it was very important to go through the motions to show Americans and to show the wider world that there was a stable, clear, unchallenged transition in the works within the United States that would help to squelch any dangers inherent in that situation. When does Johnson actually ascend to the presidency? When Jack Kennedy is declared dead? Or does he need to also take the oath of office? It's a legal question, but also a political one. He worries that without the blessing of the Kennedy family, they might be offended that he's moving too quickly to assume power. So at 1.56 p.m., he asks his aides for privacy finds a quiet spot in the presidential bedroom surrounded by Kennedy family photos and places a call to McLean, Virginia. He's very interested in getting Bobby Kennedy's advice in his role as attorney general about what had to happen in order to assure a smooth transition to a new president. This is not an easy call to make. Not only is it an emotional moment for all involved, not only is it a sensitive question to ask the brother of a man who died just hours ago, it's also a call between two enemies. Lyndon Johnson and Robert Kennedy despise each other. As Johnson remembers it, their feud began in earnest at the 1960 Democratic National Convention in Los Angeles. Kennedy had emerged victorious in the primaries. One of his vanquished opponents was Senate Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson. And Johnson was not yet ready to admit defeat. He did some things at the convention which really angered the Kennedys, particularly Bobby Kennedy, uh, Jack's brother and his campaign manager. Hoping to sway delegates, he spread rumors, mostly about Jack's health. The Kennedys had carefully hidden Jack's long struggle with illness and chronic back pain. But Johnson held nothing back. Speaking to one reporter, 
He called Kennedy a scrawny little fellow with rickets. His last-ditch smear campaign didn't work. Kennedy won the nomination. And Johnson won for himself an enemy who would haunt him for the rest of his political life, Jack's fiercely protective younger brother, Bobby. He never forgave Johnson, which was, for the most part, fine with Lyndon Johnson, who never liked Bobby anyway. He thought he was ruthless and an elitist. Bobby Kennedy was this Harvard guy who was very introverted, kind of a schemer. Someone said Bobby was a good hater. He was an intense, uh, almost fanatical person. Throughout President Kennedy's time in office, Bobby had been his right-hand man. Because of Bobby, Johnson never had the ear of the president like he so desperately wanted. The call connects, and Johnson tries to say something to comfort his rival. He knows how close he was to his brother, but maybe it comes out garbled. He's not a delicate man. The coldness in Bobby's voice surprises him. Johnson takes it as a cue to cut to the chase. When should he take the oath of office, he asks. Should he do it here in Dallas? At about 2 p.m., Johnson rejoins the Kennedy team on the plane with some surprising news. He says that Bobby insists that he be sworn in immediately. Bobby, Johnson says, doesn't want the country without a president while he flies back to Washington, especially if this is, as they both suspect, a global conspiracy. This enabled LBJ to, I think, show after the fact that he had done his due diligence, uh, that Bobby Kennedy had had his opportunity to speak his mind and to register any opposition or any concerns about the path that LBJ proposed for claiming the presidency. Later, it would be revealed that Bobby's advice was perhaps not as definitive as Johnson described. At 2.14 p.m., one hour and 44 minutes after the shooting, Kennedy's casket finally arrives at Air Force One. It had been delayed by a fight between the Secret Service and the Dallas police. A large crowd is now on board Air Force One. The plane has been running for over half an hour, waiting for permission to take off. Inside, with all the shades down and all these people and the engine running, the heat is infernal. Tempers rise along with the temperature. Kenny O'Donnell approaches Johnson and tells him it's time to take off. But Johnson insists on taking the oath of office first. RFK's orders. Even when O'Donnell bristles, Johnson is firm. Finally, at 2.28 p.m., Judge Sarah Hughes arrives. She's an old Johnson ally, and he's requested her specifically to administer the oath. But before the ceremony can commence, there's one more person Johnson wants to be present. He sends word back to Jackie, will you come out and stand beside me as I take the oath of office? And she said, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. There are no video cameras on board, or audio engineers for that matter. To ensure that the moment is recorded, Mac Kildoff grabs the dictaphone that Kennedy used to dictate letters. He holds it up between the 36th president and the now former first lady as Judge Hughes begins the oath of office. I do solemnly swear. Lady Bird stands to Johnson's right. Jackie stands on his left, still wearing her blood-stained pink Chanel suit. Her matching pink pillbox hat has been left somewhere else. Kennedy's casket sits behind them. Aides to both presidents crane their necks to watch the historic moment. Many wipe tears from their eyes. That I will faithfully execute. It's over before anyone on board can truly absorb the enormity of what has happened and Johnson directs Air Force One to get in the air. In some men, the presidency has bred greatness. They have become giants forged in the crucible of courage. Now begins a new chapter in the history of a nation grown great under the inspired leadership of great men. President Johnson faces his monumental tasks with a sense of integrity that is unquestioned, with knowledge that breeds respect, and with hope that God will guide his hand. Far into his first night as president, he faces his awesome future unflinchingly. The light of reason won't be dimmed by a rifle shot. May God, in his wisdom, help President Johnson keep it shining brightly. 
For the first time in history, Air Force One is carrying two U.S. presidents, two men from different worlds, Texas dirt roads and Boston cobblestone streets. Their paths have crossed for a brief time, and they're about to diverge again. When Johnson touches down in Washington, D.C., Bobby Kennedy will be there waiting for him, and he's not going to make this transition easy on Johnson. That's next time on 24 Hours After. Thanks for listening to 24 Hours After, a History Channel original produced by Awfully Nice and hosted by me, Steve Gillen. For more moments throughout history that are also worth watching, check your local TV listings to find out what's on the History Channel today. Special thanks to our guests, David Farber, Mark Lawrence, and Randall Woods. 24 Hours After is written and produced by Jesse Burton and Jane Ackerman. Editing and sound design by Bang Audio Post. Our project manager is Kadi Kamakate. Our supervising producers are McKamey Lynn and Ben Dixing. Our executive producers are Jesse Burton, Katie Hodges, Jesse Katz, and me, Steve Gillen. Special thanks to The Cutting Room and Haga Studios. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review 24 Hours After wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.